So in the last session, we talked about just some of the many, many open questions that there are in astronomy. And if we want to try to answer some of these questions, we're going to need new kinds of tools. We've talked about the how most of astronomy comes from studying the light from distant objects. We don't currently have the technology to actually go to these other locations, so we're pretty reliant on receiving some kind of a signal from these objects and extracting just as much information as we possibly can out of these uh, signals that we're receiving. So when we look at the properties of light, we've talked about before how different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum will give us different pieces of information. This is the Andromeda galaxy in the visible part of the spectrum, but we've also got the ultraviolet part of the spectrum where those very young, high mass, short-lived uh, main sequence stars that just recently formed are going to be shining very brightly in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. We have the X-ray view of the Andromeda galaxy. If I have the accretion disk around a black hole, those materials that are rubbing against each other and heating up will eventually start giving off X-rays. Uh, we talked about infrared light and radio waves where different kinds of gas clouds or lower temperature objects are going to be starting to give off these different kinds of light. And if we want to study as much about these systems as possible, we need observatories that are designed to look and detect and measure all of these different kinds of light. Because every single different kind of light that we look at is going to highlight different kinds of processes. Again, this is another image of the Whirlpool galaxy looking in the optical light. Uh, so we've got an optical image, ultraviolet image, X-ray image, uh, near-infrared, mid-infrared, uh, the radio spectrum, the uh, 21 centimeter line of atomic hydrogen, the uh, emissions from carbon monoxide, uh, these different chemical tracers that, again, in all of these different ways, highlight different things that are actually happening inside of this galaxy. If we want to answer as many questions as possible, we need as much data from as many different sources as possible. We've talked earlier in uh, earlier sessions how visible light and radio waves can actually make it into the atmosphere, but other kinds of light are going to be blocked by the atmosphere. The atmosphere blocks most of the ultraviolet and infrared light and all of the gamma rays and x-rays. So if I want to study these objects, we need space-based observatories. So we need observatories for all these parts of the spectrum. So for all different parts of the spectrum. And this is going to require that some of these observatories actually are in space, since our atmosphere blocks out a lot of light. Astronomers are also working to increase communication between different kinds of observatories and basically make a network where if there is a sudden event going off in space, say a supernova or a gamma ray burst, or let's say one of the those uh, uh, quasars or an active galactic nuclei is starting to flare up, that we can quickly send out an alert to all sorts of other observatories to quickly get them to also observe the same kind of source across the spectrum. And this again has been pretty successful so far in being able to get different groups of international astronomers using different uh, equipment from both around the world and space-based observatories to get them to synchronize their efforts and coordinate their efforts to be able to better study various kinds of celestial events. But just using light still, even across the spectrum, just using light still has some limitations. We've talked about how interstellar dust and gas can block light, especially some of the shorter wavelength light, um, which is why I think 
uh, observatories like the James Webb Space Telescope is specifically designed to look more in the infrared part of the spectrum, which can get through a little bit more of that gas and dust. And some objects just don't give off light at all. So if we're just using light to study astronomy, some objects don't give off light or that light can be uh, uh, blocked by interstellar gas and dust. Again, we want to see if there's any methods of doing astronomy that don't actually rely on the electromagnetic spectrum. So let's talk about some of those methods. So we are still limited in that in order to study these very, very distant objects, objects that are too far away for us to actually send a spacecraft to those locations and directly start measuring them, we are reliant on signals that are sent to us by those distant objects, how they give off light, but do they give off anything else? So what other materials might be emitted by these distant objects that we can try to detect? Well, we talked about neutrinos. So another way of doing astronomy is with neutrino observations. We talked about how neutrinos are produced in certain types of nuclear reactions and certain types of high energy reactions. So for example, our sun, the fusion reaction that's going on in the core produces large numbers of neutrinos. Things like supernovas, where the supernova explosion involves taking protons and electrons and fusing them together into neutrons, which are left behind, and neutrinos, which escape away. And those supernova events produce truly enormous numbers of neutrinos. If we can detect these neutrinos, then maybe we can use that as a tool to study some other area of astronomy. Uh, to study these different kinds of systems. We actually have neutrino observatories and they work in basically this way. This is one of the examples of a neutrino observatory. This is a picture of one. Uh, let me quickly zoom in just a little bit more on this one so you can hopefully see that a little bit better. Basically, we have this very, very large quantity of ultra pure water. And we line that entire container with very, very sensitive light detectors. Now, as neutrinos fly through the detector, we said that neutrinos will fly through pretty much anything. But if I have a large enough detector and enough neutrinos flying through it, and I wait for long enough, eventually some of those neutrinos are gonna actually start interacting with the detector. So we might get the one lucky neutrino that flies through and it hits one of those water molecules. And when it does that, it's gonna give off a little burst of light and this little shower of particles that also give off light and kind of send this little light signal through the detector. These light sensors are all designed to pick up on those tiny little flashes of light. And from those tiny little flashes figure out, well, the neutrino that hit this thing, where did it come from? How much energy did it have? What are some of its properties? We regularly see neutrinos from the sun. And we also detected a few neutrinos from supernova 1987A. That was, uh, we mentioned that supernova before as one of the nearest supernovas that have happened in recent times. And just a few years ago, we actually saw a neutrino signal from a blazar, one of those even more powerful versions of a quasar. Um, that came from this ice cube detector uh, I don't know if I mentioned this in a previous session, but worth kind of talking about again. We said in order to make one of these neutrino detectors, we need a very large quantity of ultra pure water. So think for a moment, where on the earth could I find a very large quantity of ultra pure water? And here's a hint, it does not have to be in its liquid state. So pause the video and think about that for a second. So we want this very, very large quantity of ultra pure water. Well, what about the Antarctic uh, ice shelf? That ice that has been laid down over 
you know, thousands upon thousands of years is very, very pure. So this uh, ice cube detector, they basically drilled into the ice and dropped these strings of light detectors, effectively making a detector that's over a cubic kilometer in volume. The larger the detector, the more of these little light the more neutrinos are going to hit it, the more of these little light signals we're going to be able to detect, the more information we're going to get. And this detector is designed to measure certain energies of neutrinos. And we have detected some of those from objects outside of our own solar system, outside of our even own galaxy for this, uh, for this blazar. So again, if we measure the properties of those neutrinos, um, we can detect things like uh, the neutrinos from stars, uh, from supernovas, and again, from these uh, active galactic nuclei or quasars and blazars. We've started to see some of these signals. What else could we potentially detect? I mentioned briefly in the last video, this idea of cosmic rays. So cosmic rays, basically extremely high energy atomic nuclei hitting the Earth's upper atmosphere. So extremely high energy uh, nuclei hitting the upper atmosphere. These are constantly bombarding the Earth. If you go on an airplane to higher altitudes, if you take a Geiger counter up there, there's always a certain amount of background radiation, even on the surface of the Earth. Um, so it'll your Geiger counter, which measures how much radiation there is, is going to click every once in a while. It's totally normal. If you're on an airplane higher up in the atmosphere, the amount of radiation that that Geiger counter will pick up will increase because of the presence of these cosmic rays that are constantly bombarding the Earth. So what happens is these extremely high energy particles slam into the Earth's upper atmosphere and then go through this range of reactions producing particles and antiparticles and then they start annihilating and producing secondary showers and basically produce this shower of particles that falls down onto the earth there are observatories that set up particle detectors across huge areas of space they look like large tanks of water and you'll have a tank of water here and then a few miles away there will be another tank of water and this is spread over areas, some of these detectors, um, like the Auger Observatory, covers areas of over a thousand square kilometers. And what they do is when high energy cosmic rays hit the upper atmosphere and cause that shower of particles, they identify the property of the showering particles and are able to work backwards to figure out what is the cosmic ray that actually hit the Earth. Where did it come from? How much energy did it have? And it reconstructs those uh, particles. And we've seen individual um, atomic nuclei with energies that are millions of times higher. Like, it's not an exaggeration. Actually, millions of times more energy per particle than when what we can get in even the largest uh, particle accelerators on the Earth we still don't really know how these particles get this much energy, even if they're from supernova events. Uh, the highest energy cosmic ray ever detected was dubbed the oh my god particle for what the person who was doing the uh, observing and monitoring the equipment at the time said when they got this huge spike. It was a single atomic nuclei with the same energy of a baseball thrown at 60 miles an hour. Just one atomic nuclei with that much energy. So it must have been going at like 99.999. I don't know how many nines it is for uh, the percentage of the speed of light, 
but more than you would expect. Um, it was moving extremely close to the speed of light, and there are still a lot of open questions about where these cosmic rays actually come from. So again, possibly produced in supernovas, uh, maybe in collisions between things like neutron stars. But again, there's a lot of open questions that are uh, remain about these. Another method that we can use, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on this one because this is near and dear to my heart. Uh, let's talk about gravitational waves. So gravitational waves. We talked about Einstein's theory of general relativity and how Einstein views gravity as mass and energy will change the geometry of space-time around them. And that changed geometry of space-time will affect how objects move through space. Uh, the quick analogy is the rubber sheet analogy. You put a heavy object on a rubber sheet, it bends the sheet. And then if you roll a marble beside it, that marble might end up going in orbit around the object. But that's not the only way that space-time, the geometry of space-time can be changed. Um, this idea of gravitational waves has been immensely successful at measuring all sorts of different properties. So um, just to list out some of them, the precession of planets. Um, when we look at the orbit of Mercury, Mercury's orbit is a little bit elliptical. So it's doing something like uh, doing, it's the easiest way for me to do this, uh, doing something like this. It goes a little bit closer and then a little bit further away, a little bit closer, a little bit further away. Now, according to Newton, that orbit should just continue forever. But according to general relativity, there should be a little bit of a shift every time where the point where it gets furthest away is going to turn around that the object that's rotating. It's called the uh, precession of the perihelion. And general relativity describes this. Uh, things like gravitational lensing. We talked about how uh, general relativity makes accurate predictions of this. Uh, there are There's something called gravitational redshift. If I fire a laser and it moves out of a gravitational field, the frequency of that laser will change. And we've done this experiment and it matches the predictions of relativity. Um, again, light travel time, if we curve space time, that changes how we measure space. So as light passes by an object, if it's passing by a massive object, there will be a little bit of a delay in when that object reaches us. Um, a bunch of these other ones, I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but again, this theory has been immensely successful in predicting lots of different phenomena. But one more that it predicts is that certain masses that are accelerating in certain ways will produce ripples in the curvature of space-time. So if I have a charged particle and I accelerate it in certain ways, it will produce a light wave. It will produce electromagnetic waves. In general relativity, if I have accelerating masses, say two masses that are orbiting each other, they will produce this ripple in the curvature of space-time. So massive objects in orbit in orbit produce ripples in the geometry of space-time. So you can kind of think of it like, imagine there was a swimming pool and you couldn't see the far end of the swimming pool, but someone's swimming around there. If you were to watch the waves that are coming towards you along the water, you would be able to identify, if you were able to measure them accurately enough, you'd be able to identify where the person is swimming around, how they're moving, how much they're splashing, depending on the waveforms. You could figure out a whole bunch of information just by looking at the waves that are coming off of them. 
similarly, if we can detect these gravitational waves, then we could study their sources. So these gravitational waves, they actually stretch and compress, compress space-time in different ways. If I had a ring of material and a gravitational wave was coming towards me, that ring of material would be al alternatingly stretched and compressed in different directions, kind of like these two, uh, uh, these two uh, animations are trying to show. So passing gravitational wave will cause space-time to stretch and compress. And the problem is, if gravity was, if gravitational waves were stretching and compressing space this much, we would have noticed a lot earlier. But they do this on a very, very tiny scale. So cause tiny stretchings and squishings of objects. So it causes tiny stretch and squish effects. We'll talk about how small in, in just a couple of moments. So if we want to try to measure this, this stretching and squishing, we're going to need to say, I need to measure space in multiple different directions using multiple points to identify, well, how much is space stretching and squishing in these different directions? Just like other kinds of waves, gravitational waves have a wavelength, they have an amplitude, they have frequency, uh, different waveforms, different polarizations. They have all of these different wave properties. And those wave properties are produced by, those wave properties are determined by the kinds of systems that produce them. So if we can measure these waves, we can learn about the sources. So measure the waves. Learn about the sources. So let's look at a particular case of an object that would be producing some of these gravitational waves. Um, sorry, let me, I guess, uh, uh, how do we detect them? Again, we said that a passing gravitational wave will alternatively stretch and compress space in different directions. So one of the main ways of detecting them is by using what's called a laser interferometer. I take a laser, and I split the path of that laser beam. So I take a laser, fired in this direction. Some of the laser light bounces this way and returns. Some of the laser light goes this way, bounces off that and returns. So the laser beam is split and then reflects off the two ends and then is recombined. And goes to a detector. The way this system is designed is if there is no gravitational wave and those two arms of the detector are just a certain distance apart from each other, a certain relative length. When the signals recombine, those two waves are designed to perfectly cancel out with each other. When we try to recombine the waves, when one wave is at a crest, the other is at a valley, and those two waves are canceling each other out, and we get no signal. But if I'm stretching and compressing space, if I'm stretching in one direction and compressing in another, then those two waves won't perfectly cancel each other out. When they return back to the detector and uh, are recombined, they won't exactly cancel each other out. And we're going to get that gravitational wave signal. 
So if a gravitational wave has affected the length of those two arms and the lasers that are traveling along those two arms, then we won't get that perfect destructive interference that cancels out the signal and we will start to see something. And let me just kind of show you one of these detectors uh, for a minute. I'm gonna pause the video so we can get you a picture of one of these detectors. So one quick pause. Okay, so this is an image of the uh, one of the two LIGO detectors in Hanford, Washington. There's another one in Livingston, Louisiana. And again, this is the building where a laser is produced and then that laser beam is split going along these two arms, bounces off the end of the, the mirrors at the end of those arms, it comes back and is recombined. And we try to use this to detect these gravitational waves. Uh, a lot of pilots that pass by overhead are kind of wondering why is there this giant pipeline that go that starts in the middle of nowhere, goes here, makes a right hand turn, and then just goes to another part that's in the middle of nowhere and just stops there. Uh, it's actually this LIGO, uh, one of these LIGO detectors, and the arms of these detectors are each around four kilometers long, about two and a half miles long. And in order to detect these gravitational waves, they have to measure length changes that are less than one one thousandth the diameter of a proton. Let me say that one again. The arms of these detectors are around four kilometers long and the length changes that they're trying to measure, the tiny, tiny, stretching and squishing the space that they're trying to measure is one one thousandth the diameter not of an atom but of a proton we said if the atom were the size of the room the nucleus where all the protons and neutrons are would be like a speck of dust in the middle one one thousandth the diameter of that little speck of dust in this atom which is also you know extremely extremely small so this is one of the most technologically advanced laboratories with the most stable labors, uh, uh, laser systems, um, with the most accurate data analysis system, the most perfectly set up mirrors, the most perfectly seismically isolated things. We don't want the ground to be shaking. I've talked to some people who've actually worked at these locations and they've said that every morning at around 6.05, they start to get a little bit of a signal and that occurs when at around six o'clock, a lot of people in the local areas are waking up. And one of the first things that they do is use the bathroom. The water running through the pipes causes enough of a, of a vibration that this detector is able to pick it up. They can actually detect when planes are flying overhead uh, based on the effect that it has on these systems. So the reason why we need two of them is so no one terrestrial source could affect both locations at the same time. Again, one of them is in Hanford, Washington. The other one is in Livingston, Louisiana. They are far enough apart that no you know, small tremor in the Earth's crust could affect them both at the same time. Uh, we look for signals that happen in both of those detectors simultaneously. And this has now actually been joined by other detectors, the Virgo detector, and hopefully soon we'll get uh, a couple other detectors in, I think one in India and one in Japan, joining this network, increasing the, uh, increasing the sensitivity of all the detectors together uh, as a whole. So again, this is an incredibly advanced uh, method, but what sort of sense, what sort of uh, systems are they trying to detect? Well, this is a computer simulation of two black holes that are orbiting each other. According to Newton, according to Newtonian gravity, if these two objects are just orbiting each other, they should just keep on orbiting each other forever. But according to general relativity, if they're giving off these gravitational waves, that system is gradually losing energy and those objects are gonna start falling inwards. As they fall inwards, just like the figure skater pulling their arms in, they're gonna spin faster and faster and it's going to look something like this. So we've got the two black holes orbiting each other. These colored sections 
represent the different gravitational effects that are being produced. And as they spin in closer and closer, they're going to produce stronger and stronger gravitational waves. And right as they start to merge, they get this burst of gravitational waves uh, that have gone up in frequency and now just kind of gives off this burst. And now we have the merged black hole at the end. Now, just in case that didn't play super well on the original version, uh, I know sometimes videos work on this, sometimes they don't. I'm going to change my share slightly just to kind of optimize this for the video clip. Uh, probably can't see me anymore, but let's give this a try. So again, we've got these two black holes orbiting around each other. And as they start to fall in on each other, that conservation of angular momentum is going to make them spin faster and faster. That's going to produce both higher frequency and higher amplitude gravitational waves. We get this burst of gravitational waves right as they're merging. And then we have the resulting single black hole, uh, single merged black hole at the end of this system. Let me change my share back. So according to this, if our model is correct, then these two black holes that are merging, the gravitational waves that start out, it should be this low frequency gravitational wave, but as they get closer and closer, the frequency and the amplitude should increase. We get this burst of gravitational waves and then the merger together, and it kind of rings down at the end of this. We call this a gravitational wave chart. So again, the LIGO system is the most sensitive Earth-based detector. And on September 14th of 2015, the newly initiated systems, they had just gone online. In fact, they were still doing their engineering runs to make sure that everything was working properly. Um, this is the signal that was picked up from Hanford, Washington. This is the signal that was picked up from Livingston, Louisiana. And both of those show this gradually ramp up. And all of a sudden, we get this gravitational wave chirp that is distinctive of a pair of merging black holes. So these properties matched the expected waveforms from two black holes that are in a binary system and eventually collide with each other, eventually merge together and collide with each other. And since then, we've detected quite a few dozen cases of black holes merging with each other. We've detected a few black hole neutron star mergers, and we've uh, detected a few uh, neutron star collisions. So again, this is a new way of doing astronomy, a new way of studying different kinds of astrophysical systems, not by looking at the light that's coming off of them, but by looking at the gravitational waves that are coming off of them. There's another method that we can use called pulsar timing. Pulsars, we talked about them earlier in the course. They're a kind of neutron star that's spinning really quickly and has this beam of radio waves coming off of it. So every time it spins, if you're looking at this with a radio telescope, you're going to get a little blip, blip, blip. And for some of these pulsars, we can very, very accurately predict when each pulse should arrive. So we know when these pulses should arrive. But if a gravitational wave were passing by, that would distort space and time, causing the signals to arrive either a little bit early or a little bit later than we would expect. If we can measure these timing changes, we might be able to detect the signal of a gravitational wave. And if we specifically look at a whole bunch of pulsars across the sky, uh, collaborations like NanoGrav, the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves, and other uh, collaborations around the world making up what's called the International Pulsar Timing Array, um, are currently observing quite a few dozen individual pulsars and seeing, are there any correlated signals between the timing changes that we're seeing in these different pulsars? Because one pulsar, well, I could just have the model wrong. Something could be off with just that one pulsar, or maybe my 
understanding of where that pulsar is on the sky is a little bit off or the spin rate is a little bit off, something could throw that one pulsar off. But gravitational waves would cause specific signals in when one of those gravitational waves is passing by, then pulsars in this direction and this direction would be a little bit early. Pulsars in this direction and this direction would be a little bit late. And if we see those correlated signals for pulsars across the sky, we can associate those with specific kinds of gravitational waves. Um, these methods are still being worked on. This is still being developed. Uh, but hopefully in the next few years, um, Nanograv and some of these other detectors will be able to directly detect these gravitational waves like LIGO has. When we talked about the spectrum of light, we said there's different parts of the spectrum that tell us different pieces of information. You know, the short wavelength gamma rays, the gamma rays, x-rays, and ultraviolet light, the longer wavelength infrared and radio waves, those all give us access to different information. In the same way, we have what's called the gravitational wave spectrum, and different kinds of systems would be expected to give off different kinds of gravitational waves. So right now, we are able to measure the gravitational waves from neutron stars and stellar mass black holes colliding with each other. We've done that with LIGO. Uh, other systems have been proposed to measure things like relic gravitational waves from the original Big Bang. We said that when we talked about the properties of the Big Bang, we said that we can only see using light back to the end of the era of nuclei and the beginning of the era of atoms when that CMB light was produced. But gravitational, uh, and the reason for that is because before that, in the era of nuclei, the universe was opaque. Light couldn't travel freely through the universe, so we're not going to be able to see any further back than that because the universe was literally opaque. You couldn't see through it. But gravitational waves can pass through basically anything. So maybe gravitational waves would give us an ability to see even further back, maybe even back to as far as early on as the GUT era. This could give us the tools that we need to see how the universe was in some of its very earliest moments. The ideal case would be saying, let's take these observations that we already have using light, using different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, and combine that with neutrino detections, uh, cosmic ray measurements, gravitational wave observations. And this could answer many different questions. Um, for looking at high mass gravitate, or sorry, high frequency gravitational waves, things like the collisions between uh, black hole binaries will tell us something about, well, how many of these black hole binaries are there? How common are they? How are stars formed with different masses? Gravitational waves should be given off by neutron stars if those neutron stars have a little bit of a mountain on one part of them. If I have that spinning neutron star with a mountain, that should produce gravitational waves. If we can detect them, we could identify, well, how large can a mountain on a neutron star be? And that will start telling us the properties of that neutron star material. If we look at low frequency waves, like the uh, like that pulsar timing method is good at doing, we might be able to measure supermassive black holes. Say, if I have these supermassive black holes orbiting around each other, we'll be able to detect those. This is going to tell us about the merger history of the universe and how those supermassive black holes formed. Did they form before the rest of the galaxy? Or did they form later on after multiple stars had been sucked in by some larger black hole? There could be some signals, like I said, from the very early universe that might have a gravitational wave signal and allow us to study some of these new areas. And there could be gravitational waves coming from sources that we never even thought to propose. Uh, there's always a possibility when we get some kind of new tool to study the universe that we're going to just detect things that we didn't even expect, didn't even think to look for. So 
as one last example uh, to put all this together, let's talk about this particular uh, case. This is from August 17th in uh, 2017. The LIGO detector and the Virgo detectors detected this gravitational wave burst from the merger of some two of two objects. Two seconds later, the Fermi gamma ray telescope had identified a gamma ray burst in space. And within a few minutes, so the Fermi satellite reported its finding 16 seconds after detector, after detection, uh, the LIGO and Virgo within about half an hour, they were able to say, yep, we've detected something in this region of the space. And very, very quickly, the call went out to all telescopes, search for the source search for some new source in the sky. We have images from other, the sky on, on other nights and see if anything's different. And within just a few hours, a galaxy was discovered where there was a new source of light from there. And after that satellite or uh, uh, different observatories were measuring what is the spectrum of this object? How is that spectrum changing over time? This light's fading. Let's keep an eye on it as it fades out. And it was identified that what caused that gravitational wave burst and what caused that gamma ray emission was two neutron stars that collided with each other. During this collision, extremely large amounts of heavy elements were produced and ejected into the rest of the universe, uh, the rest of the region around that galaxy. It produced over 10,000 Earth masses of elements heavier than iron. If I remember some, if I remember the numbers correctly, it was something like 500 Earth masses of gold, 800 Earth masses of platinum produced in these uh, in this one particular event and then distributed back into the rest of the universe. This tells us things about gamma ray bursts. It tells us things about the properties of neutron stars, how heavy elements are being produced. It was one of the first ways that we verified that gravitational waves really do seem to travel at the speed of light. Because again, the gravitational wave and that gamma ray burst, even though it has been traveling for many millions of years, they got to the Earth at pretty much the exact same time. When we talked about those modified theories of gravity, saying dark matter, is it really a thing or is it some mistake with our understanding of gravity? A lot of those modified theories of gravity predict that the speed of gravitational waves shouldn't quite match the speed of light. But this observation put some really, really tight constraints on those modified theories of gravity. Again, these methods using multiple tools, multiple areas of science to try to study the same sorts of things, this is what allows us to answer some of these new and future questions about astronomy. So I hope that uh, this is the last session for uh, this particular course. I hope that this course has been interesting, uh, that you've seen how the scientific method is applied in a lot of these cases. Um, uh, so I hope that you get something out of it and hopefully something that you can also use these methods of building models, critically analyzing data, seeing what conclusions you can and cannot reach. I hope that this is useful in uh, some of your future careers. And uh, yeah, as always, when, when questions come up about any of this stuff, as you're you know studying, always feel free to ask questions, come to office hours, those sorts of things. But uh, thank you for your attention throughout the course and all the best in your future uh, academic and professional uh, uh, goals.